So, on to the, the formal introduction. Uh, Carolina Bertero is a Colombian activist for access to knowledge, a lawyer, a member of the uh, Charisma Foundation, part of the free software community, co leader of Creative Commons Colombia, and regional manager for Latin America at Creative Commons. So, I welcome Carolina Bertero. Thank you very much. Uh, I just want to start by saying thank you to all of those who invited me here, and especially to Silke, David, and Mike, that were very kind to to help into the presentation. Um, I, I, of course, do not want to charge on them. The responsibility on the presentation is fully mine if you like it. If you don't, then blame them because they helped. Um, <laughs> How do I put this? Can you help me here, please, to put it there? Um, I, I want to advise at the beginning, I am an activist, so I don't know about anything in deep. The experts, those, you are the experts on this. And then, of course, uh, what I do know about is a lot of digital commons, a lot of what Mike said I shouldn't talk about. So I was forced to use examples of my daily life. Just mercy with me if I'm not expert on what I'm going to use. Anyway, my presentation is what if fear change sides. I want to start by saying um, that this is the relation I want to start with. Uh, if, we, if we acknowledge that information is power, if we acknowledge that knowledge is power, we should then acknowledge that controlling both either or both information and uh, knowledge, we will have power. Uh, why does this relation matters? Because the control of information and knowledge can change sides. And this is important because the power relation can be changed. This relation, power, change, is what means fear. If we manage to change the relation of power or if, if we manage to m think that we can do it, we are generating a fear. And at least in what I work day to day, that's what we, we understand. All the enclosures that we're seeing in the last decades are not less, not more than fear. Fear from... Uh, the change of this power relation. So they asked me to talk about information and knowledge and not to talk about what I know, which is digital part of it. So let me start by saying that um, how we produce knowledge and information, how we, how we distribute it, how we use it matters. And this is what we're going to talk about. There is a very pessimistic point of view to this, but we are here to talk about commons, commoners, commoning, so we should start by recognizing that we are lucky. And there are still many ways to do things, to produce, to use things. And therefore, I would like to pose to you some more like questions rather than uh, strong affirmations, strong sentences. The first two is how can we switch the tendency of knowledge regulation away from enclosure? How can commons become the rule and not the exception? And then I, I will have to also point out something. The speaker just before me said, commons is a, not a nice word in English, where you're lucky. In Spanish, we don't even have it. So this is very important. We are constructing, we're building the knowledge, and we have to start by posing the right questions. The first example I'd like to point out as to, I, I will remind you these two questions, how we switch tendencies, how can we make it a rule and not an exception. My first, my first example is midwives, Spanish parteras. The midwives, um, if you have read something in feminism, and of course there are many of them here, and, and in history and whatever, you, you know the strongest enclosure that these persons, normally women who help other women to deliver babies, 
were submitted to. They were witch sometimes. They were totally left aside when the doctors, essentially men, took their place. And the whole relation with birth even changed altogether. The idea of the way we deliver today in hospitals with the doctor aside is completely different to the way it should have been if it was in another place. In Colombia, uh, we have very remote places. So there are a lot of uh, indigenous culture, black communities, so on. There's a lot of uh, popular knowledge still in the air. And probably non, there are a lot of places where a doctor don't even show up. So that's, that's your doctor there. And there is right now a huge movement that is uh, especially driven by this woman that is uh, Rosmilda, the older one from the picture. And she's uh, partera from the Pacific part of Colombia that's been moving the pride of being a partera and the right to exercise her work There's even uh, a, a draft law. They're trying to push it up to make it legal because right now it's illegal. And to make a whole movement towards them as being able to help others, not just the woman who's in delivery, but also the doctors. Okay. What they want is to be recognized as, as somebody that can do something which is legal, not illegal and that they know. So it's a recognition of knowledge. Um, my second question will be, can we switch market logics by showing there are other logics? Okay, first example is the written music in Colombia, uh, Spanish partituras. The written music in Colombia in the 18th and 19th century was basically manual. It was written by hand, and it was copied by hand up up until very into the 20th century because there was not really a market for that. So people would just share it and pass it on and whatever. However, all the intellectual property laws that came into force talk about industries. And of course, we're protecting industries from the north. And in the U.S., you do have an industry that produces massively The, these partituras, this written music. Not in Colombia, but now we're tied to the intellectual property laws. And intellectual property laws says that those uh, protected works that are not printed, are not published, have a strong moral right. And the only one can allow a reproduction, modification, anything, is the author or the right holder. Therefore, today... All the, literally all the students in Colombia that study music are totally pirates because it's impossible to have music that otherwise would be in the public domain used by them. It's easier to use classical music from Europe probably than to have a nice balls from 19th century in Bogota that was played in Bogota being used by them. They can't photocopy. They, of course they do it. But I mean, Why? Why to have this kind of enclosures? And to pose a, an example that is more tangible for maybe all of us and more recent, Silke said, put some numbers, but I just found that it was nicer a picture. This is World Mapper, and it shows you the 2002 relation of income by royalties in the world. So instead of the space, The, the, yeah, the kilometers a country occupy in the map, it's been changed by the number, by the income a country received during 2002 for royalties. Of course, Africa disappeared. Japan is a huge continent. U.S. takes most of what it's America, probably. And, well, U.K., it's bigger than Europe, and so on and so on. This, this shows you the relation. So there's no an innocent position on the way that uh, intellectual property is being crafted during the last decades. It's really been done to uh, privilege, to, give a, a, to keep the position for some of them. Again, sorry, my examples are mainly intellectual property because that's what I work on. So I would 
after these couple of examples, I want to say that there's a problem with our imagination and knowledge. I'm not referring to this specific group, but humanity. Imagination and knowledge is a problem because we're having problems to imagine how to provision and govern resources, information, and knowledge. We just can think on exclusivity and control when we think on this. So oral imagination and uh, knowledge, we can't think it without exclusivity and control. And that's a relation that we have to switch in order for us to switch the relation of power. My other question will be, can we measure commons values? This morning, by hearing an economist uh, that thinks from, from the side of, of the commons, Joshua, I was excited. I can't, I've not been able to find in Colombia one economist that will help us to think about commons, at least not the ones we can afford because there must be a lot. I mean, in Colombia, we do have a strong tradition on commons, and that's water, and they are talking on mining, on water, on those things. But digital commons, no way to just think on Google then, Yahoo. It's not possible. But how can we measure common values? How do I go to a politician and tell him, you know, what libraries do matters? And that has relation with copyright. Can we replace individual incentives as core in the knowledge regulation? And there, intellectual property takes again an important place. I'm not going to try even to say this in French, but those of you who have been in, Ly in Lyon will know that this is the main square of Lyon. And there was a, an important um, court decision on, on this square. The old picture is the former square. The new picture is the new square. It was redesigned in order to put some parking lots down and to facilitate the tourism and so on. So an ar the architect and the artist who did this had an, a right, a copyright over the new landscape for the urban city. When the when the square was finished and the photographers came to take pictures and make the new postcards, they start, uh, they sue this postcard company because they were the copyright owners for the new design of the square. That was, uh, of course, a trial. And finally, the judge decided that this was an accessory, an accessory right related to the principal right and the principal, the, sorry, an accessory <coughs> It's not good. Bien, bien accessorio, an accessory wood that has that has to follow the destiny of the main wood, which is the square as a whole. And the square, really, most of it is public domain. So just don't bother. Your copyright follows the public domain. Let them take the pictures. That's kind of funny, also, because it poses the situation of private versus public. Not really common. It's private versus public. Another, this one I'm really scared now. I was in the water group, and you know a lot about water. I don't. Sorry. But in Colombia, there's a lot of people who knows about water, and there are lots of commoning. I'm just placing this example because it really has to be with me. We have a problem, again, because there has been attempts of privatization, but the real problem for me in the water right now, especially for small, muni for small municipalities in Colombia, is that the aqueducts have become public. And all the big municipalities and the state and departments and so on have told the little municipalities, that's a good, you just take care of it, charge for the water and take care of it. And that's what they do. They charge and they provide water. They try to do it for everybody. But most of the small municipalities are not taking care of the water. And that was evident during the last strong winter we have. Colombia, for those of you who don't know, we are in the tropic, so we really don't have the seasons. We call winter when it rains and summer when it's sunny. So saying this, a strong winter, which means a lot of rain, and despite the fact that there was a lot of rain, 
there were a lot of little towns that were without water. The place where we have a small summer house in uh, close to Bogota was without water. And we start looking at why. The reason is nobody's taking care of the aqueduct. To just charge and give, and they pay a salary to somebody that will go and make it uh, drinkable, and that's it. The situation is like that in many, many places in Colombia, despite the fact that it used to be a commons and there were a lot of people looking at it. But the switch, there was a point on the switch where states stopped giving money to care about water and they are just charging and getting the, and getting the, the water. I want to say with this that that's the situation in all Colombia. No, the paper behind the picture shows very successful small commons aqueducts in Medellin, a huge city. 30% of the water in Medellin is managed through commons practices and not through the central aqueduct of Medellin. So there are very diverse things going on there, but what I care the most is that the individualism point of view of many of them is putting in a terrible position, small towns in Colombia, the second country who has the most diversity and the most rain in the world. No, no way to say that that's for us. So in this kind of situations, can we blame individualism or have we inadequately articulated the value, either qualitative, quantitative, or any of the commons? Or have we missed adequate infrastructures and tools to raise the common? This third point is important. We do have to think about infrastructures because they care. So if we call ourselves commoners and and we try to, we have to be consequent with it. Call it money, call it software, whatever. I'm not going to go in deep in here because I have a limit time of, but I want you to think about that also on infrastructures. <coughs> so finally, and just to put myself where I know, because I am an activist on intellectual property law, I would like to put you this last question. Can we introduce the commons discourse from the front door and not from the back door? And by saying this, I will start by blaming myself. I don't do that. Normally what I do is, the, is that I try to include the commons into this discourse, but... Since the debate is based on knowledge requires enclosure, what I do is I put it through the back door. And I'll explain this. The picture you're looking at is just an infographic of TPP, which I think, who of you do not know anything about TPP? Okay, so I'll explain then. So TPP is the Trans-Pacific Partnership Agreement. The Trans-Pacific Partnership Agreement is the new, if you have heard about ACTA, NAFTA, TAFTA. So TPP is the one for the Pacific. And it's the new uh, kind of club for some countries to do the, to, to get into our commercial agreement that includes a lot of things, but among them intellectual property. <coughs> With this agreement, we will raise even more the minimum standards of, um, of intellectual property, fighting piracy, and this will mean more years, I think 120 years of protection uh, for some certain um, intellectual property goods. Uh, there's going to be uh, more measures on DRMs, that's the digital locks. So when you buy a CD, it has a digital lock. You can't copy it to the MP3. Of course, you call your son and, and he does it for you. But in Colombia, the son will be facing four to eight years jail. And that's not normal, but the TPP will raise it for all of you. Uh, and kind of that small measures, but all together, it's an, a more... Uh, a bigger enclosure. The point is when, when I as an activist go to the, to the politicians, it's not a brand to say I come here on behalf of the commons as you said. I have to say, you know what, well really in corporate law there's something that's called public domain. 
and we have to take care of it too. So you can't just keep on putting more and more time of protection because eventually we will not have public domain and that's not good. You know why? Because on, on the public domain, you can use it and privatize it and really that's what Disney did and he made a huge amount of money on that. I mean, really, really, who who can say that Cinderella was was Disney's good idea. It was here in Europe, I don't know, three centuries ago. It, he just took it from the public domain and made it for the customer that today needs. But he just want now to keep Cinderella there. So if I explain it like that, the politician will understand me and might change his mind. I can't go with the commons because it will take me three years, something that I could explain in two words. So I blame myself because this is what I do, and it's exactly what Michael, Mike start by saying, this is what the, um, how do you call it, the exit, the, the, exit, the, the successful movements that use commons are doing. We are hacking the law, but we're not doing it up front. So I'm here, and I want to continue coming to commoners' meetings to remind me that there is one day probably when I will do it through the phone door. And uh, when we were discussing my presentation, this sentence jumped out of Silke's voice. She said it was through a discussion with Severin Dusolier, and this more or less was the conclusion. And this is from a Lawyer mind, very difficult to understand. But I am trying to make it, you know, something uh, to look at when I wonder the day I can come through the front door. So intellectual property reform and licensing are just a small part of a universe of knowledge commoning. Movements like transparency, privacy, collaboration, the money, all that part are potentially all of science and culture too. That's why probably you miss in this presentation talking about Wikipedia and all those wonderful digital commons I do know a lot about. But the idea was precisely to let you know that when we talk about information and knowledge, there is a very transversal discourse that we have to find and build together. In order to do that, I just want to leave you with three ideas. <coughs> I couldn't bring coffee for all of you, so I brought a small and nice flu to share. When and how did we accept that the autonomy of all is sub subservient, oh, that English, to control of knowledge by few? How come? And that's the question for myself. I all, the, all the time I have to come with a few because the majority says this or a lot of them, this is a question. Can we stop this? Can we change it? Is the current tragedy our lack of knowledge in the commons? And again, these three points are merely for me, especially my own reflection. So again, starting with what Sorry, finishing with what I started. Information is power. Knowledge is power. So controlling information and knowledge means to have power. There are no innocent laws behind this. I, I wrote two sentences here because I knew I was going to forget it. So I'll read them that like right now so you think on this relation. When I show you the reading music, I was meant to say it. Market logics. Market logics drive the current status quo in the regulatory framework, increasing social economic inequality and diminishing public spaces every day. When I show you the square in France, I was meant to say, legal system of intellectual property place individual financial incentives at the center of knowledge regulation, marginalizing common values. So I just wonder if we think about this and we think means to change the power relation, could we change? Is, it, there's, is there any chance that we can change sites and make them fear change of the regulation? Thank you very much.